Hi, welcome to Conversations with me, Karen Van Horen, a fashion historian and curator. My guest today is Michelle Miller Fisher, a curator who worked in some of the most prestigious institutions in the country. Her conversation, however, centered on her activism in the area of labor and equity in the art and museum world, where she has been one of the most vocal and influential voices. We also talked about her upcoming book and exhibition, Designing Motherhood, and how her work on the MoMA exhibition, Is Fashion Modern, really changed her outlook on a broader design history discourse. Hi, Michelle. Hi, it's so nice to be with you. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, it's really such a pleasure to have you. Um, I'll start by asking you to introduce yourself, uh, just say who you are and what you do. Sure, so my name is Michelle Miller Fisher and um, I'm a museum curator. Currently I work at the MFA in Boston. Um, I'm originally from Scotland and so I moved to the States about 15 years ago. And what I do is usually working in museums. I've held a number of different jobs, but right now I'm a curator. I also teach and then I write. Um, and I work mainly in terms of my research in um, the contemporary moment so in the 20th and 21st century in craft and design. I also look a lot at art and labor and I'm really interested in everyday objects and their politics. And your resume is beyond impressive. Uh, I would say that you worked in almost or if not all of my favorite museums and I'll just I'll just, you know, say them out loud. Um, the museum, you're right now at the Museum of Fine Art Boston. You've been to the Philadelphia Museum of Art, MoMA, Guggenheim, Metropolitan Museum. Um, really an impressive resume. But I think what, uh, in addition to all of the work that you've done, what really drew me to your work and what you do is maybe, you know, another aspect of your work that's activism. Um, in your push for transparency, um, you know, labor um, rights, the right to organize, um, and a bunch of other um, aspects that relate to um, rights of people who work in the museum and the art world. Um, so I would really would love to hear you talk a little bit about how it even began that interest. Sure, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think there's lots of different spots along the way that I think generated or germinated my interest in art and labor. Um, and I'm happy, like, I'll maybe describe a very abbreviated version of this, Karen, and then you can tell me if there's a, a place that's the most interesting to delve into. Um, in, if I go way, way back, I come from a very working class family. My mom didn't graduate high school in the end. And so going to college was a big deal for me. And I was the first in my family to do it. And so um, like many, many people before me and after me um, in my situation in my country, uh, in Scotland and here and, and across the world, I paid my way through school. And so I think anyone who's ever had an hourly wage, um, who's still on an hourly wage, who doesn't get paid an awful lot, which is most people in the arts, um, understands that their labor is, you know, it, it's hard won for them. And so watching my mom do a series of fairly low paid jobs, going through that myself for a long, long time, I was a nanny well into my years at MoMA. And that was by then my third museum job in a, actually not in my third museum job, my third museum job in the US. Mm -hmm. So I was very well aware of the way in which my labor um, was contingent on institutions, the largesse of people who were, you know, earning much more than me, donors who create these spaces, and that there was an inherent politics to the way that labor is in the world, in the museum, but in much wider senses. And so as I went through my undergraduate course, um, I, I didn't do anything in the arts until, you know, the very last couple of months of my fourth and final year, um, because like many others, I was, um, came my way through by doing waitressing and cooking and other things. And so when I came to be able to do gradually little bits more and more in the art field, um, 
I would have conversations with people and it was very clear that alongside all of the work that folks were doing and are still doing in the area of the, the world that I now find myself working in, everyone had very long shadow resumes. Um, everyone was working several other jobs to be able to work in this industry. And I don't think that's um, exceptional to museums or art, the art field alone, um, but it's endemic in our field, definitely, whether in academia or within, within cultural institutions. And when I came to the US, I realized that certainly the um, experiences that I'd had in the UK, where class plays a really big factor in who can exist in these spaces, who gets hired for these jobs, um, who gets to access them in the first place. When I came to the US 15 years ago, I suddenly realized, um, you know, we're not taught a ton of really any US history in the UK, I started to realize the other intersections of privilege and of opportunity or barriers that people uh, experience here. And um, as I'm sure, you know, uh, Americans don't need to be told, and I have learned over the last 15 years, um, one of those massive um, uh, intersections is race. And so my understanding of work has always been a political one mm -hmm. uh, throughout my own experience, not through any kind of fancy theoretical knowledge um, and through watching people around me, especially my mom. Um, and first it was through the lens of gender and class and latterly here through race. And um, it became impossible as I sort of went on in my studies and in my uh, work experience, looking at material culture, looking at craft and design, um, everyday objects that make up our material world and are not in any sense divorced from economics, politics, the social, um, to, it was impossible to work in this area and not understand my work and the other um, you know, staff working um, as somehow distinct from the conversations that were happening in galleries, in public programming, in publications, in, in the, the field in its public face. Um, and so another kind of touch point and the most recent one was about a year and a half ago in May of 2019 when I was having a conversation with colleagues uh, after work over drinks and um, Many of us have done uh, career conversations now. We're in mid, mid stages of career. And um, whenever I do, and I know many others do the same, they will be transparent about their pay, their salary, their working conditions, so that other people entering the field have something to, to you know, hold on to as they do. The conversation happened to be, and yeah, art, art museum transparency was what came out of that conversation. The conversation was what number should one put on a cover letter when they were applying for a job? Um, and that quickly spiraled into what were we actually paid at that point in time. When we started to compare notes, um, we realized that um, there was pretty much like, quite large discrepancies between similar job titles. And so, um, that evening, we just decided to create a Google Doc, which we did a spreadsheet, um, add in several columns, and we made it public um, through the CUNY uh, Graduate Center list of the art history program, where I am um, still a student, um, and then over social media. And that started a conversation, um, which then very quickly in the next day or two started this collective called Art Museum Transparency, which works in a long continuum of others who have had similar conversations. And so, before AMT, I certainly written around unpaid internships, um, around, I felt very, feel very strongly still, I wrote a, a, an op-ed a couple of years ago for Hyperallergic, it's still I think the thing that people respond to the most around parenting and labor in the art world. Um, when I was at MoMA, for example, I don't think I ever saw another curatorial assistant um, have a child. Um, it was almost unspoken that a family life was not conducive to being able to spend, you know, 16, 18, sometimes 20 hours a day at work. And so the ways in which art and labor come together in our field, um, you know, riddled with different types of inequity um, and oversight. Um, and that to me is really fertile ground for investigation and for being aware of. I mean, before AMT, I don't think I'd actually looked up a 990 report, a tax report for any of the institutions for which I'd worked. Um, and that was something that was really eye-opening to me to understand that the top 10 figures in most of the institutions that I worked for were pulling in millions of dollars while most of the people who were working on a median salary, not even the lowest hourly salary without benefits, but a median salary, they were earning, you know, 10, 20, sometimes as much as 40 or 50 times the amount of, of that person. So for me, 
um, this has been a inseparable from the research that I do um, around design and craft and other contemporary currents of um, art and, and making but also um, a really wonderful way to be collaborative in the field. Um, we have a team, um, everyone else at the moment is anonymous, although I don't think it will be that way for much longer, but um, we have a team of colleagues at AMT now, and it is non-hierarchical, deeply respectful, incredibly collaborative, and a real delight to be able to work in that way. Um, and I think that's why many of us come to craft, design, fashion, sort of areas that are not quote unquote the fine arts because there's often, I have found personally, and I, I would be interested to hear your experiences, but I found there's a greater generosity between colleagues in these areas. People make, people design collaboratively. It is a team-based effort a lot of the time. Even if we're talking about one fashion designer, it's a whole ecosystem that it takes to create. Um, Whereas I think artists and art historians are perhaps, you know, not always, they too have workshops, but maybe more um, solo workers, may I even say sometimes like territorial about their work. Um, and I have found much more joy in my working life, not being territorial, but being able to be in these collaborative situations. So AMT has been one of those for me. But I don't know if you found it the same. Well, I can, you know, speak from very, like my very personal experiences. I think my whole career was really shaped out of exactly those issues. Um, I was never able to do free internships because I came into this profession after having a career as a fashion designer. So um, I already had a family going in and I was never able to afford the childcare and going out and not getting paid. So I was always had to, I could never work in institutions. I always had to make my own projects, my own work. So I think it, in a lot of ways, it really shaped um, not just the kind of work that I do, but the way I do my work. Um, it frustrated me at times. Um, it still does. I think, you know, our museums um, are, and we're not talking personally about me, but in general, I think there are a lot of like different points of view and very talented people that are um, not present in, you know, the kind of the way that museums can uh, move forward. I think yep. a diversity of people, and when I say diversity, I don't necessarily mean just race, even though that is obviously, um, a very important component of it, but it could be intellectual diversity, it could be age, it could be, um, you know, family situation, it could be a lot of different things, ethnicity, um, that I think museum could really benefit um, from having more of that. Um, and so I think your project really like touched something that has always been, um, always bothered me. And it kind of like touched in a really concrete way where I could, okay, there are people, if the right people that ha do have the power and who are in the positions to really push for those things, speak up, things can, you know, things can really move forward. And, you know, I really appreciated that. And, you know, my question to you, you are the face of, um, of this group. Um, who is mostly, you know, most of the people in the group are anonymous, like you said. And so I was wondering, first of all, what it's like, have you had to, um, have you, were there any negative um, outcomes? Um, how did it gel with your institution? Yeah, it, I mean, so <laughs> I don't think that anyone is ever going to promote me any further than I am now in an institution because I definitely see a, a wariness from leadership, from people like not people who are my immediate supervisors with whom I have a great relationship, like a really res respectful, thoughtful, warm, um, wonderfully supportive relationship, um, which is, you know, a, a, a boon in any workplace when you have a supervisor who's just amazing and, and direct colleagues who are amazing. But um, 
would anyone like entrust me as anything like with a leadership position in a museum now? Probably never, um, given that this is part of my background. Um, certainly I've had um, pushback from folks who are in positions of leadership, not just at the institutions where I've been when this has happened, um, but more generally, you know, people don't appreciate being served up a problem in plain sight. So, you know, if you're looking at this spreadsheet and the issues that come from it, um, it's looking at pay inequity, it's looking at um, pay that's too low, it's looking at a an ecosystem that's founded on people doing a lot of work for free and unpaid internships and volunteer positions. Um, and I think those two are two distinct roles. Um, and, you know, a volunteer isn't necessarily a bad thing, but an internship that's meant to be for, you know, educational purposes and, and to be able to sort of move up a career ladder. If they're being paid zero, then everybody else doesn't have to be paid much more to create a, a, a wage chain. And so, um, yeah, a lot of internships for credits, which you're right. essentially paying for your internship. Yeah, I mean, it's it's futile. It's it's crazy that um, someone would be paying a university institution um, money to then go have the pleasure of working for free. I come from Scotland, where my entire education was free, um, and I, you know, that was the same for me. The child, first child of a, a single parent going to become first generation at college, but also true for like whomever up the road had two parents, two incomes and could afford to pay. Like education is seen as a human right. Whereas here, as you say, you know, not only in the internship, but many people are now contributing to efforts like this and many, many others, the plethora, the kind of, you know, blooming of activism that's happened over the last um, year or so is because I think people are graduating with historic levels of debt and then are being told please go work for free for some time. Also the job market is cratering, so you probably will never get a job in the next couple of years, if ever. Um, and you have to work in an environment that, you know, isn't always uh, kind, nurturing, thoughtful, isn't, as you say, diverse across any intersection. Um, and I think, you know, younger generations of workers are coming into the field and saying like, no, we could do better. And, and actually I'm going to raise my voice and say, I want to do better. What I'd love to see is, older generations speaking out because I think they understand what the problems are but very very few of them are willing to put their own professional reputations or positions on the line to actually create any change so there's a lot of lip service paid to these issues and very very little in terms of people who hold substantially secure positions actually doing something about these issues which is disappointing. What are some of the most striking things that you saw in that spreadsheet that really like surprised you? Yeah, so um, the fact that, I mean, the the median wage, and I'm now forgetting the exact figure, was somewhere in the 50s, um, and the discrepancy between um, the number of degrees that, you know, that, that you know you need to get some of these positions versus the pay, um, and not that, you know, there's some kind of, like, gap between the vast intellect and the pay, but literally, like, you need to buy those degrees in this country. And most of these folks are identifying as like having gone through the educational system in this country. Um, so just the cost benefits analysis of people being told like, go get a master's, go get another master's or a PhD, and then come into this field where you can't even afford to support a family, let alone you know, yourself, let alone a family. Mm -hmm. So I think that the discrepancy between the um, number of degrees you know you've been told you need versus the pay that you're going to get. Um, the whiteness of the field. There was a column um, that, you know, was actually a really interesting discussion that happened when the survey went live. I forget exactly which columns we had, but I think through all of them, we, yeah, I think we did say, if you want to list your gender, you can, if you want to list your race, you can, but our general mantra was be safe, be comfortable, like don't feel like you have to do this at all. And there's a really fascinating and, and necessary discussion that happened between folks um, sort of saying, you know, if you put your race and it's anything other than white here, you're literally outing yourself. You're no longer anonymous because there are so um, few BIPOC colleagues in the industry at large um, that with a simple like looking at the institution and the job, general job title, you kind of know who that person was. Um, and then when we did the second intern, uh, second spreadsheet about six or eight weeks later, and it was on internships, the things that really stuck out to me were 
we left a space in there for people to do much more kind of narrative responses and just the ways in which people had been poorly treated, you know, badly managed, not thanked for their work, um, taken as sort of uh, expendable, usable resources rather than folks to be mentored. And um, it therefore doesn't strike me as odd that a year later we're seeing like on the Change the Museum Instagram account, for example, or in other places like that, this outpouring of stories of toxicity in the workplace because, um, <laughs> you know, because the workplaces that we work in are, are, are not often well managed. Um, there are definitely exceptions to that rule. There are some fantastic people working in management and in leadership. But um, yeah, the, the, the general structural inequity of the art and museum field was laid bare, I think, in this spreadsheet, had been laid bare before by many people who had suffered these inequities and um, is being forced out into the open in the last couple of months um, by people who understand that social media, digital platforms can be used to put sunshine on this. Mm -hmm. Have you seen any direct outcomes to the spreadsheet? Yeah, so we definitely heard of both individuals and actually in some cases, entire departments having salary bumps after this. So oh. people either from grassroots um, or from top down, like a department head bringing it into a meeting. And so brilliant department head, wonderful, great when people are doing that saying, this exists out in the world, let's have a discussion about what people are, how people are compensated and how that should change. Um, but also people bringing it to the attention of HR, of leadership and saying, we've been systematically undercompensated, please fix that, it's just not okay anymore. So um, I do think also this spreadsheet was in a continuum, people doing work before us, people doing work after us. So I think it's part of a wave of momentum of people um, understanding that they hold power and not having to ask for permission. Um, I think it is great to work collaboratively with your institution where you can, and it doesn't always have to be, you know, this hitting of us against them. But um, when you see things that could be done better and people just say, well, you know, it takes time. That I think um, has enraged people enough that they're taking it into their own hands in terms of everything from salary transparency to thinking about more equitable structures for racial diversity and other things in the museum. And I think something that comes to mind as you speak, and I think something that I really appreciate um, about you is how you always give credit to the people you work with, to the people that you collaborate with, um, and even people that work, you know, under you. And so, and I think that is also, you know, a big part of it, a big part of like who does the labor, the actual labor and whose name is on the product, whatever that may be. Um, it's unconscionable. I mean, I, you and I have one foot in academic worlds. And um, if you write something, you put your name on it. Anything else would be plagiarism, right? right. If you have an idea, if, if you are writing an essay, I mean, we've all heard stories of when professors try to co-opt their students' research, maybe more often in the sciences, but no, not always. Like it happens in humanities and social sciences too. And that's just like, there's, it's, it's absolutely black and white. It's ethically wrong to do that. Yet, when you get into the museum, it completely blew my mind that um, the same could happen in terms of a curatorial project where a curatorial assistant could write everything, 50% of things, 75% of things. And if they were lucky, if their supervisor was nice, they might get a shout out in the acknowledgements. I was really lucky to work for a supervisor where that was not the case, mm -hmm. but I was also very, very honest and open all of the time. If I'm putting, if I'm doing the work, I put my name on it. Um, and if other people are doing the work too, their name should be on it as well. And, um, when it's been my project that I've been able to, and I say my, it's always a we, it's never a me, but um, when it's been a project where I have agency to set that agenda, it's unquestioned. Um, and I think that I, I hope anyone working on those projects know that that's the case. One of my colleagues, um, a really brilliant design historian, Juliana Barton, turned me on to the idea of shine theory, um, which was um, a coined probably about eight years ago now, I think by uh, two people, Aminata Sao and um, Anne Friedman. And uh, the, the idea is if you make sure that everyone in your orbit is credited correctly or is lifted up, like it's the theory of when, you know, uh, uh, high tides lifting all boats, 
And so the shine comes back onto you and it's just sort of this mutual reflection. Um, and I think we all know like workplaces work better when everyone feels like they've had a thank you said for their work, that they are, are noticed and acknowledged. Um, it's so easy and it's super free <laughs> to say thank you. Um, <laughs> like it's 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 not that hard it's it's the easiest cheapest method of um you know a good workplace vibe uh it's crazy to me how often that is not done um so yeah so like you said collaboration is really at the heart of what you do and that sort of like brings me to um you know the next um, thing that I wanted to talk to you about, which is designing motherhood. So I would love for you to just, you know, in your own words, just like introduce what it is. Of course. So designing motherhood is um, the brainchild of, there's a lot of collaborators on this one. My, the first collaborator, equal partner in crime, like absolute um, ride or die, work wife forever is Amber Winnick, who is an amazing design historian, um, a double Fulbright winner, like super smart, amazing person who I met probably about five or six years ago. Um, and she or I, she and I were talking about um, the real absence of material culture that deals with the arc of human reproduction in the spaces in which we work. She had just graduated from the Board Graduate Center. I was just starting a job at MoMA. And um, so that really sort of started a series of conversations that then started a promise to one another, let's make a book about this. And we didn't know what that was going to look like at the time. Um, but Designing Motherhood, Things That Make and Break Our Births, came out of that early set of conversations with Amber. Um, and we, um, we worked on our own for a long time, putting together a book proposal. This was at the end of the, like, 2016, 2017. Um, she was looking at um, different material cultures of pregnancy and had done work in Hungary, actually, on her first Fulbrights, looking at respectful parenting and the um, different designs that she'd seen for that. Um, she'd also looked at pregnancy fashion, and there's Amber there, and with Charlotte Burns, who's an amazing um, uh, art historian in her own right at, at Art Agency Partners. Um, and we ended up, um, I was working on items, is Fashion Modern, a, a, a fashion exhibition at MoMA. Um, and I ended up being able to slip in some maternity wear into that exhibition, um, which was super fun. That was a, sort of the first time I'd really written in public about this. Um, and it also was around the same time I'd said to Paola Antonelli, who's the really fantastic long-standing senior design curator at MoMA, I said to her, you know, I think actually the breast pump could be a really interesting thing to acquire for the museum to have in the collection. Um, it's not out of place in terms of a longer historical arc of labor-saving devices aimed at women, but designed primarily by men. And so when we think of like kitchen gadgets of the 30s, 40s, and 50s, the um, breast pump from the 1950s designed by Ina Egnell would not look out of place in the museum's collection. Um, Paula had said, you know, I don't doubt it. And I think it's a great idea. And this is the Ina Egnell um, pump, which is a great design history backstory to it as well. It didn't end up being able to be proposed at MoMA though. And so Paula said, you should do something with this. So this was a conversation with Amber that was latent. And that's where really Designing Motherhood came out of. And then we partnered with the amazing Maternity Care Coalition in Philadelphia, who've been for the last 40 years working with pregnant people and their infants up to the age of around three to help them access services like culturally appropriate care or early childhood education that they wouldn't otherwise be able to um, access. And along with Maternity Care Coalition, the Mutter Museum, which is the medical museum in Philadelphia, the Center for Architecture and Design, and UPenn. Um, this will now blossom into a, um, a book that will come out next year, a series of exhibitions and public programs next year, and it's been funded by the Pew Foundation. Amazing. You know, it's so, I mean, obviously as a mother, I think I find this you know, really interesting. I also have a very complex uh, relationship to breast pumps, uh, <laughs> as I'm sure anyone who have used it have. Um, and I think it also, you know, it kind of like what I really like about it is, first of all, thinking about sort of like, like you said, the everyday objects that we use, where they're coming from, who's designing them, 
who's using them and if it's not the same people you know like what does it tell us about those relationships right um, so and if they're not found in our museum exhibitions or if they're not preserved in the spaces of culture where we preserve other types of design like who's making those decisions which goes back to what you were saying about like a diversity of many different types within institutions um which you know a, a, a one barometer of how we value things in culture absolutely yes yeah. And so what are some other objects that you have encountered in this project that have any like interesting backstories? Yeah, so I mean, many of them, um, the back the design backstory can be summed up by product made for people who have ovaries or uteruses, very disputed, you know, territories in general, usually made by men. Woman identifying person comes along and says, you know what, I think we could do this better. Men say, no, I don't think we should trust you with that. Woman says, actually, here's a really great design. And then it becomes something that we use every day. So with the Egnell um, breast pump, this was the first time really in the 1950s um, that uh, women, people who were lactating, uh, were consulted directly about what might be conducive to their lactation rather than um, folks making these types of machines just looking at bovine subjects, so resulting, resorting to cows and data from cows. Um, another object which I particularly love is the design history of the home pregnancy test, um, which Meg Crane was instrumental um, in, and, you know, she, she was the progenitor of the designer of in 1969-1970. Um, she was a really young 26-year-old at Organon, um, which was, is a pharmaceutical company. Um, she was working at one of the headquarters in New Jersey, and she was um, working within a team that designed packaging um, for new products. And so that team sort of uh, branched out into scientists and people working with the actual, you know, uh, chemicals in the uh, company. One day she was walking through past some lab benches. She was like, what's going on there? And her colleague said to her oh, that those are pregnancy tests. And she said, oh, you know, I, I'm sure you could package those and it would be possible to have that as an over the counter. Um, and she was basically told, you know, seems strange like our, our main um, uh, clients are doctors and so I'm sure they wouldn't want to lose this business to an over-the-counter um, but you know see what you can do so she created this really sleek beautiful prospect package and um, easy instructions for, for someone to look at um, but she wasn't actually told that the company Organon had taken on her idea, gotten some funding for it and hired in an outside advertising company and so that advertising company um, uh, came along to give a presentation. She found out at the last minute. So she came in and she saw three of their prototypes on the table. She plunked hers down as well. And um, the advertising head came in late to the meeting. He looked down the table, picked up hers, and she, he said, well, this is it, this is fantastic. And everybody else in the room, the execs from Organon said, well, don't you want the one with like the pink one or the one with the tassels or the bows? Because <laughs> of course you need a bow to be able to help you with your pregnancy prediction. And so the beautiful story is that then that became the over-the-counter home pregnancy test. And actually Meg ended up marrying and having a wonderful long design partnership with the head of the advertising agency. <laughs> She still lives in New York. She's amazing. Um, I met her and had a cup of tea with her last year. Um, but yeah, so, so many stories. And you wonder why they haven't really been given the time of day. It happened also with the proposal for Designing Motherhood. We had a book proposal for it. And Amber and I sent it out maybe three years ago, maybe a bit longer. And we sat back in glee, kind of rubbing our hands, being like, People are gonna love this. It's gonna be great. We're gonna have so many people fighting over themselves for this. We didn't hear back from one of them. And we sent them to like lots of different types of publishers. And then, <laughs> then last year, after Me Too, after Time's Up, after lots of sort of protests around gender and um, uh, you know human rights, gender rights, racial rights, because it's a really, really, really important history in terms of designing motherhood about um, the expertise of black midwives um, and uh, uh, black women in general, in the US in particular, who have um, both cared for and um, in many ways, uh, without their permission, been central to the history of developing gynecology, for example, with the speculum and J. Marion Sims. So there's a really important, many different intersections here, but it took 
public outcry for then three publishers actually in one the same week to come back to us with an email to say we've been thinking about it and actually might be really interesting if women were telling their own stories could we talk about your book again and we were like yeah no duh <laughs> sure <laughs> um so yeah that that's how we came to get a publisher it took a long time um another um aspect that I find really interesting in your work. You were uh, doing your PhD at the CUNY Graduate Center um, in uh, architectural history. Yeah. And, um, you know, one of my interests um, in fashion kind of morphed into this uh, interest in space and fashion. And, um, there's, there's a project in my future <laughs> um, about the evolution of fashion spaces. Um, mm -hmm. I find that there's like really, really interesting connection between a space and who gets to use that space and what, how fashion is consumed, displayed, uh, used. You know, one of the most fascinating articles that I read is... Um, this article by uh, the late historian Stephanie Kemp, who wrote about um, enslaved women who made their own clothes um, um, during the night, wove their own clothes, dyed the, the yarns, and dressed up and made even shoes and hats and accessories, and would go out during the night to this like illicit parties um, in the plantations in the South. And, um, that along, you know, a, like the slew of like scholars who kind of talk about fashion and space have really kind of turned me on thinking about this evolution of, um, especially from moving from the 19th century into the 20th century, and now we've been thinking about beyond into the 21st centuries, um, digital spaces, you know, thinking about even the mail order catalog of the 19th century is like a space of fashion. And I would really love to hear you talk, you know, from your own, um, you know, vantage point as a, an architectural um, um, historian, you know, how do you see that relationship between architecture, between space and fashion? Yeah, I mean, I can think about it in one very direct way. So I worked in MoMA's architecture and design department for over four years. And one of the projects that I worked on there with a team of people, um, was Items is Fashion Modern. And that was the first exhibition that MoMA had devoted to fashion in over 70 years. And hearing you talk about um, Stephanie Kemp's research reminds me of just the power that fashion has to connect to um, or to, to articulate and to, um, to uncompromisingly uh, uh, hold space for identities especially in many ways, I think, identities that have been historically marginalized, erased, or um, not made space for in institutional um, areas, whether that's a museum or within government policy or other kind of social apparatuses. And so um, I remember at the very beginning of research, wondering why we had never had a fashion exhibition before. And it wasn't for lack of trying on Paola's part. She'd been at the museum then for just under 25 years. And she, you know, she grew up in Italy, in Milan. Like she, she was not unaware of fashion. She was deeply aware in, in many ways, but this had not necessarily been a focus of her work at the museum per se. Um, but I think I am trying to remember the story. She, she, one of her very first internships was in a fashion house. So, you know, th this was part of her, her language. It just hadn't been part of the exhibitions necessarily um, that had happened at MoMA. And she said that um, there was a point where she had raised this with Philip Johnson, um, the long-standing uh, chief of the department, um, many years before, probably in the 90s, when he was still there and she was first hired. And he said, well, you know, we wouldn't want to tell our lady trustees how to dress now, would we, by having a tradition on the Which <laughs> so thinking about the relationship between architecture, space, and fashion, thinking about MoMA as, you know, the first... Um, architecture department in, in a museum in the US and the power and potency that holds in terms of 
setting the benchmark for you know creating the whole you know well not creating the whole I will I will take that back but 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 for playing a significant role in the promotion of modern architecture um, in in Europe and, and and North America and beyond. Um, playing a significant role in what uh, design exhibitions might mean um, over time, in what modern design might mean, in what you bring into your home as a design object through their good design shows. By no means are they the first and last word on it, but they have a significant weight in terms of certain conversations in design histories and therefore shape the um, narratives that become books, that become exhibitions in other places, that become curriculum, um, that, that that really shaped so many other facets of the field at large. And so it was really joyous actually, and I hope there will be more exhibitions of fashion in that space. Um, I think they've got to run for their money, obviously, because the Costume Institute, FIT, and many other places, you know, boy graduates and lots of places in New York alone, let alone um, across the country and the world, um, think about space and fashion and the architecture of the exhibition. But, um, I will never lose now the absolute sea change that occurred for me. I can never teach a design history now without recourse to fashion. And in fact, without really centering fashion as part of that discourse. And it was never something I was taught through four degrees. Um, and so that siloing, the sort of keeping separate um, fashion, I've definitely experienced being in the contemporary world and understanding um, design somehow weirdly to be uh, seen as separate than the rest of the fine art world. Um, and fashion has that happened to it within the design world. Um, some of the most amazing scholarship I've ever read has come out of the fashion world and I was completely ignorant of that and to that until this project, which shone so many lights on things. And then when I think about the most important designer, I think working today, it was the person that we met through items, um, Kirby Jean Raymond, who I just, I have followed his career since learning about it in 2015, 2016. He contributed to the exhibition. He came along to do one of the public programs. And I, um, I really venerate his practice. And I, I, you know, so I think about the, the triumvirate of triangle that you, that you set out there of, um, architecture space and, and fashion and thinking about the, the politics imbued in those um, and think of someone like him or just thinking about a space like MoMA and its historic resistance to fashion and if, if an institution like that is so leery of something it's like a red rag to a bull I mean there has to be so, substance there if they're so afraid um, so that's that's the, the first thing that comes to mind. I'm wondering like when going back to what you said about teaching and including fashion uh, i'd love to hear you talk a little bit more about that how do you incorporate um, fashion or what have changed in the way that you teach the design history now sure yeah and i don't get to teach as often as i would like to um although i think that will hopefully change now that we don't all have to commute into work five days a week but i um co-taught a fashion, uh, sorry, I co-taught a design history course at UPenn when I was in Philadelphia. And um, it was co-taught with someone who is primarily an architecture professor, although he's a genius and teaches across many different um, disciplinary uh, intersections. And then someone who is primarily deaf arts. Um, and I teach a lot like, you know, it, it, depend, it depends what I'm teaching, but this was a, a design history course that spanned really, you know, the, the date in which we began, but I think it was around the uh, 1500s and came to the present day. And so for the classes that I was responsible, I was looking almost like I would in the museum. And it comes out a lot um, in terms of, you know, my first job in the US was at the Guggenheim and it was in museum education, out of object-centered learning, about being able to take one object and to use that as a lens for much wider conversations. So we, I really took research from items, looking at the Aaron sweater, for example, and being able to think about histories of craft and um, things that are very near and dear to me in the Celtic tradition, um, or being able to look at histories of cosmetics and race, um, and being able to talk about uh, not only um, you know, the, the history of you know, wearing red lipstick, for example, or wearing any kind of um, accent on the lip or the nail, um, but thinking about the histories of um, 
how that was marketed and who it was marketed to, to and um, what kinds of graphic design and advertising came out of those things. And I found by using that kind of very object-centered methodology for teaching, um, students' research was also amazing. I learned so much actually from the students too. Um, one student in particular, Ginny, did an amazing um, uh, reflection on the history of the jumpsuit in the World War II period. And again, like these are, they were able to take elements that you know, we only touched upon, if at all, scratched the surface in an exhibition, but through an academic paper, really kind of did a deep dive and were able to marry their own interests, their own identities, their own, um, you know, questions that connected to their own lives with um, material culture in a, in a kind of everyday sense, which I really loved. And so, yeah, that for me has been very different now. I, I, I cannot imagine teaching now and not thinking about the ways in which fashion would play a role in whatever syllabus I was creating. How about for you? Are you teaching at the moment, Karen? Um, this year I'm not teaching um, as I'm doing my PhD program, but I actually did something very similar with my uh, textile history students where um, you know, I let them do sort of like flip the classroom kind of thing where they pick an object and they had to put together um, a, really like a lecture uh, with questions for the other students and, and really thinking deeply about objects and we call them windows. I call them, you know, a windows into a specific society, um, a specific moment in time. Um, and because that class spans like ancient Egypt to early 20th century, you get this really, really range, um, interesting range of objects. And I, I encouraged, encouraged the students to really look at their own stories, at their own families. I have one of the students did an amazing paper about pineapple textiles, textiles that are made of pineapple leaves um, mm -hmm. that are, you know, come from the Philippines. And so this was really, really, really interesting. Um, and like, like you, I've learned so much from the students, um, which I love. Um, and my scholarship has always been centered on objects and especially everyday objects. Um, obviously I come from like a fashion design background and sort of like fashion history. So I find that, you know, fashion is a very easy thing to access, but I, there's a lot of things that I include within fashion. Like you said, makeup, um, even cigarettes at some point are, like part of fashion and the way they're advertised is a really could tell you so much about that moment in time especially in terms of gender and race um so i think very you know very much in in the same way and 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 i do hope that you know once i'm done at least with my coursework part of uh, my phd program i can i can go back to teaching because it's really something that i really enjoy and gives me back so much yeah I feel the same and I, I think that's why some of my happiest times in the museum have been in museum education departments and why I really hope actually we see more directors and leadership come out of museum education um, because part of what you do there is facilitate the experiences or offer platforms for people to bring their own experiences to objects and to have that wonderful marriage and conversation that can happen. And through that, you get to decenter what you think you know about art history or you think you know about material culture history. Um, and that's incredibly powerful because that's where we start to understand that there's no such thing as the canon, just you know, bodies of knowledge that we inhabit and that we're proximal to, that we don't know and we're going to learn that we'll never know. Um, and these things overlap one another and, and that's the best student discussions that we have where you're like, I had no idea, but this is great because then you can connect it to X, Y, and Z things that you do have in your toolbox, so. Exactly. Michelle, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate that you took the time um, to have this chat with me. And I really appreciate all the work that you do um, in museum and in the art world and in education. Um, you're really incredible. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Karen. And I always say teamwork makes the dream work, like we do it together, right? So thank you. Yes. It's nice to be with Thanks. you.